If you have a Bible, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 11, 12, and 13 this morning. As you're turning there, welcome. Uh, my name is Jamin. If you're new, uh, if you're visiting us, we're honored that you chose to worship with us this morning. If you're watching online, uh, wherever you are and however long you've been doing that, uh, welcome. Um, this will be our last sermon in the Wisdom series until the fall. Uh, you're supposed to sound disappointed or something like that. Okay, thank you. Um, a few reasons for that. The main one is wisdom has a pace. It's slow. And I've just gotten a sense from God that he's using this, and uh, I, I want to extend it. I want it to be in wisdom for a really long time, but I need time to think about that and to seek God on that, and uh, I need wisdom. I lack wisdom. So we're going to break uh, for uh, the summer, and then we'll pick it back up in August. Um, this morning, we'll be in Ecclesiastes again. This is week three in Ecclesiastes, and so do something with me that we did last week. Would you pray with me? Would you hold your hands out in front of you like this? And just repeat this prayer after me. God, life is a gift. You are the giver. Thank you. How do we live that out? How do we live in this heavy life as if it is a gift? How do we grow muscles for approaching life, receiving all of life? as a gift. Well, that's what this passage will help us do this morning. It teaches us specifically four things. Be present, see beauty, do good, and receive joy. Uh, We will rely really heavily on the last two weeks this morning. So let me recap a bit by way of story. Uh, The summer before my eighth grade year, uh, we moved from Duncanville, which is up here in the DFW area, to a small country town 90 miles south of Dallas called Fairfield. If you know Fairfield at all, it's probably because of a restaurant called Sam's. And if you know Sam's, what Sam's is well known for, it's it's right on Interstate 45, and it's famous for its country-style breakfast buffet. So here's what you need to know about Fairfield. Fairfield is the kind of town that's famous for its country-style breakfast buffets. It's (laughs) small-town Texas. And it was quite the culture shop moving from Duncanville to Fairfield. In Fairfield, my graduating class was 97 people. So it's a small East Texas town. And there were things I loved about it, really. But when I, inter- uh, when I enrolled in eighth grade at the junior high, there were only two elective options. The two elective options were you could do band and PE or you could do art and football. And I wasn't interested in any of those. And so I literally just asked the guidance counselor, I said, will you pick for me? And I don't know what this means, but she sized me up and she put me in art and PE. And so um, the next day I'm at church. Um, It's the new church that my, it's a church that my dad had just started pastoring in Fairfield. And this guy came up to me at church and he said, hey, I heard that you signed up for PE and art. And I said, hi, my name's Jamin, because that's how relationships start, right? (laughs) And uh, he was a coach at the high school. And uh, he said, let me tell you something. If you don't play football in this town, you won't have a single friend. And he was not being mean. He really wasn't. He was just trying to help me. He was a, he was a kind man. Fairfield had a strong Friday Night Lights vibe to it. And so uh, what he was saying is this is a football town, and, and you're going to have a hard time if you don't play football. And I took it seriously. So I went in on Monday, Monday morning. And I changed my elective from PE to football. And that afternoon, for the first time in my life, I was standing at a football practice in full pads. It was like 200 degrees outside. And I'm standing there sweating and confused and just there to make friends, right? And we did all these drills that I didn't know how to do. Just lost the whole time. And about 20 minutes in, the whistle blows. Everyone ran to the sideline, took their helmets off, got on a knee, got in a single line, and a coach walked down the line with a single green Gatorade bottle filled with water, and the kids opened their mouth like a baby bird (laughs) while the coach gave water to each kid, like a few seconds each kid, and then moved down the line. And it was like oddly militant for eighth graders, I thought. And I thought, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that. And so I, I had brought my own water. And uh, I went to get my water bottle um, from where I put it, and uh, and the whistle blew again, and everyone was helmets back on, and then they ran on to to the field. And I tried to get water real quick, and the coach yelled at me, and so I ran back on the field thirsty. 
More drills. 20 minutes later, the whistle blows again. Everyone runs to the sideline. It's helmets off. It's down on the knee. It's the baby bird thing. It's a single line. And, and I try to make it to my bottle. And the coach yelled, Jamie, get in line. <laughs> and by Jamie, he meant, he meant Jamin, obviously. Um, so I ran, I think. So I ran to the front of the line, but the water had already passed, and so I missed it. And the whistle blew, and I missed it again, and ran back onto the field, thirsty. And 20 more minutes. At this point, I'm miserable. I'm thirsty. I'm super hot. I'm frustrated, and I have made zero friends in all that time. <laughs> After another 20 minutes, the whistle blew again, and that time, someone grabbed me by the shoulder pads. And it was this kid named Kyle, and he would be one of my best friends throughout all of junior high and high school. And he drug me to the sideline, and he took off my helmet, and he told me to take a knee next to him. And he said, this is the only way to get water during practice. And he meant it just sincerely. He said, this is the only way to get water. He said, when coach comes, drink as much water as you can. So I did. I got a drink. Then it was back to the drills, and then another 20 minutes, and the whistle blew, and then Kyle grabbed me again and drug me by the shoulder pads and put me next to him. And he, took, and he said, this is the only way to get water during practice. And so the water came, we got a drink, I survived and made a friend. That memory, truly, came to mind as I was thinking about how to tie together where we've been in Ecclesiastes these last few weeks. The book of Ecclesiastes is that new friend that kind of jarringly grabs hold of you and drags you to the right place and puts you in the right posture and says, this is the only way to live. It's the only way to live life. Ecclesiastes, if you remember, is wisdom's disruptive voice. 38 times in 12 chapters, we hear the word hevel. It's a Hebrew word, and that's how the book starts. Hevel of hevels, says the preacher. What do we gain from all of our work under the sun? Everything is hevel. And hevel is a word that means smoke or vapor. And wisdom's disruptive voice uses this image, the image of vapor, the image of smoke, to rightly critique life. It invites us to imagine what vapor is like and what smoke is like and what fog is like and then accuses life of being just like that and accuses life of three things. It's short. A generation comes, a generation goes. Uh, it leaves little lasting impact. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be remembrance of later things yet to be. And it's out of our control. Just like, just like if you were to try to grab steam or to grab vapor, you couldn't really get your hands on it. That's life. It's hevel. And so two weeks ago, we said it's like fog on the morning drive. It's short, little impact, out of our control. Last week, we said it's like steam from a coffee kettle. It's short, it's little impact, it's uncontrollable. Maybe in some ways, it's like a, a water break at a small town football practice. But 38 times in 12 chapters, that's the truth that thunders throughout the book. Hevel, all is hevel. Life is short. There's very little lasting impact. It's mostly out of our control. And then five times. The clouds part, and wisdom's disruptive voice says things like this. Life comes from the hand of God. It's chapter 2. Few days of life God has given. Chapter 5. The life he has given you under the sun. Chapter 9. This is God's gift to humanity. Chapter 3. Life is a gift. Wait, I thought life was heaven. I thought it was short. I thought it was little lasting impact. I thought it was out of our control. I thought it was fog. I thought it was kettle vapor. Yes, and it's a gift. And the only wise way to approach life in the heaven is to receive life as a gift. And many of us, myself included, approach life in ways that make us miss life. We approach life in ways that are incompatible with the heaven of life. We named three last week, and we need them to be front of mind with where we're going this morning. Uh, one of the ways that's incompatible, one of the ways we approach life, what makes us miss life, is that we approach life like it's a problem to solve. And if life is a problem to solve, my posture in life is I wring my hands and my response to life is I'm always afraid because, hevel, we can't solve all of our problems. The second one is we approach life like a competition to win. And so my posture in life is wondering eyes. I'm always looking around at everyone else that I think is doing better in life than I am. And the, and the experience I have of life, the thing I feel most in life is shame because hevel, we can't be good enough or do enough to silence our shame. And, and the third is we think life is a right that I have earned. But hevel, life isn't fair. So we clench our fists and our hearts fill with anger. And listen, like a new kid 
in a new town at his first practice, trying to get water his own way, when we live with wringing hands and fearful hearts, when we live with wondering eyes and shame in our hearts, when we live with clenched fists and angry hearts, we miss life. We stay thirsty. We miss the gift. And so Ecclesiastes is the new friend who grabs hold of us and says, come with me. Let me show you. He opens his hands out in front of us and says, do this. Life is a gift. This is the only way to live. Receive life. Drink while you can. He points to our wringing hands and says, don't do that. Open your hands. Life is a gift. He points to our wondering eyes and says, don't do that. Open your hands. Life is a gift. He points to our clenched fists and says, look, I get it. Of all people, I get it, but you'll miss it. Open your hands. Receive life as a gift. That's the wisdom. The wise approach life open-handed, receiving life as a gift. And we put this approach to life in a short prayer that we already prayed. We hold our hands open and we pray, God, life is a gift. You are the giver. Thank you. Chapter 3, verses 11, 12, and 13 tell us how to grow in that. They're going to tell us to be present, see beauty, do good, and receive joy. Let's do the first one. Be present. Look at chapter 3, verse 11. He has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Two truths, so important to take both of them together. The first is this. We have an unignorable desire for there to be more than just the here and now. He says he puts eternity into our heart. It's a beautiful verse. You, friend, have an eternity-sized desire in your heart. You long for transcendence. You long for something that's beyond just the here and the now, and it's because God has placed eternity in your heart. And, and, and humans can bear all kinds of things. We can endure suffering and pain and loss. The one thing that we cannot endure is meaninglessness, and it's because we have eternity in our hearts. There's an author named Julian Barnes. He's an English writer. He's a brilliant writer. He's not a Christian. He's an agnostic. Here's what he says about Christianity. He refers to Christianity as a beautiful lie. And he wrote a book in 2008 called Death, or About Death. That would have been a terrible name for the book. He wrote a book in 2008 about death called Nothing to be Frightened of. And the book opens with this line. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. He explains it later and says this, I miss the God that inspired Italian painting and French stained glass and German music and English chapter houses and those tumble-down heaps of stone on Celtic headlands which were once symbolic beacons in the darkness and the storm. He's referring to the art and architecture that was around him where he grew up. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. And when I see art made by Christians inspired by that God, when I, see, when I hear music made by Christians inspired by that God and the buildings and the architecture, it makes me long for the beautiful lie to be a beautiful truth. I don't believe in God, but I miss Him. Do you know what we're hearing? Eternity in His heart. That's eternity coming out of His heart, and it's in all of our hearts. And even those of us, and maybe you're in the room, even those of us who say there is nothing beyond this, there is no eternity, there is no God, there is no more than the here and now, what we can't shake is we can't shake the desire for it to be true because we have eternity in our hearts. We have an unignorable desire for there to be more than just the here and now. We long for transcendence. We long for God. Here's the second truth. We only have capacity to live in the here and now. He has put eternity into man's hearts. That's so beautiful. It's so great. And then look at this. It kind of takes a downturn. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. What, what does that mean? There's a desire for eternity, but we don't have the capacity to understand all of eternity, uh, to discover all that there is to discover. We only have capacity for the here and now. Stay with me. This is so important. G.K. Chesterton, he's another English author, but he's Christian. He says this in his book, Orthodoxy. He says, there are two kinds of people. There are poets and there are logicians. Poets are those who observe and create. Logician are those who worship reason, who worship their own ability to understand everything. And they have two different relationships with the eternity that's in their heart. They both sense it, but they respond differently to it. He says this, the poet accepts it. The logician demands to understand it, wants to have possession over all of it. And here's what he says. It's brilliant. 
the poet only asks to get his head into the heavens. It's the logician who seeks to get the heavens into his head, and it is his head that splits. Which one are you? Poet or logician? You have eternity in your heart, and how do you respond to that? Are you content to get your head into the heavens, or are you trying to fit the heavens into your head? And he means that intellectually, trying to know all there is to know, but it's a helpful picture for how so many of us try to live beyond our limits, and it's a helpful picture for what's happening right now in our moment in culture. Um, it's not enough to desire eternity. We want to be eternal. Like, we want to... We, we want. Uh, to be unlimited by time and space. And just like our heads don't have capacity for the heavens, your life, my life, does not have capacity to be more than one place at a time. We don't have capacity to live in more than one moment than this moment that we're in right now. And the more we try and grasp beyond our limits, the more our life splits. The lie of our day is that through technology and all of our advancements and all of our devices, we can live here and there. We can live now and then, and it's not true. We are living in this really scary moment where we are trying to possess attributes that are only true about God and are only meant for God. I'll use the theological words. We try to be omniscient. It means all-knowing. I am a search away from all my questions being answered. I don't ever have to live in the unknown. We try and be omnipresent. It means everywhere at all time. I am an iPhone away from being able to be multiple places at once, work and home at the same time, church and work at the same time, with friends and with other friends in different places at the same time. And the biggest lie is that being all-knowing and being all-present makes us omnipotent. It means all-powerful. All-powerful over my problems, all-powerful over my social life, never have to miss out, all-powerful over my questions, all-powerful over my life. And you know what's happening? We're splitting Our lives are splitting. We can't get the heavens into our head. We, I know you know this, we are in an unprecedented mental health crisis in the West right now. And while the causes are multifaceted and really complicated, a major contributor are all the ways we try and fail to live beyond our limits, to live beyond our human capacity. We are not God. He is eternal. He is all-knowing. He is omnipresent. He is all-powerful. We only have the capacity to live in the here and the now. And the more we push those realities, you know what happens when we push against those realities? We wring our hands and our eyes wonder and our fists clench. Okay, you have eternity in your heart. You have an unignorable desire for there to be more than just the here and now. And you cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. You only have capacity to live in the here and now. So here's the wisdom. Be present. Be present. Receive the present. Open your hands. Be completely present to where you are and when you are. And here's what happens. When you are present now, you know who you find when you're present in the here and you're present in the now? Do you know who you find? God. The eternal God present in the temporal moments of the here and now. Isn't that the whole point of the biblical story? God with us. Is with us even now. And it's this kind of paradox. The desire for more than the here and now begins to be satisfied as we find God and are present with God in the here and now. I want to get this right. Let me be clear. You are made with eternal desires and you were only made to be in one place in one moment. And you find the eternal, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful God in the ordinary places and ordinary moments of your life. Be present to them. Be present to them. Like right now, just to put this on the ground, if during church this morning, if in this moment right now, if you're trying to be somewhere else, in another conversation, working on something on your phone, or just working on something in your head, you're not here, and you'll miss God. Uh, If right now you're trying to live in another moment, maybe you have plans later today, maybe you have plans later today around 7 o'clock that you're really excited about, like I am. Please, God. (laughs) Or maybe there's something heavy that's happening in your life later this week, and and, and you've given emotional energy to that already, and you're giving mental resources to that right now, and so you're trying to live in a future moment. But you know what? You're not there. You're here. And that moment hasn't happened yet. That moment might not happen. And so if you try and live outside of now, you'll miss God. He made you to be right here, right now, and right here, right now is where he'll meet you. And that's not just true when you're in church. 
That's true every single moment of your life. Be present. Open your hands to where you are and when you are. You know how I've been trying to grow in that truly? Just by praying our short prayer often. When I feel pulled out of the presence into another place, when I feel the pull out of the present time into a future time, just open my hands. God, life is a gift. You are the giver. Thank you. And what I'm finding is I'm finding that it's hard to ignore God in the here and now when I'm talking to him. Be present. All the other points rely on this one and flesh this one out, so let's move on. See beauty. Look at verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. If you look at chapter 3, just look at your Bible real quick at chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, they're probably uh, 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 oriented differently than the other words. It's because it's a poem. And you might be familiar with this poem, or at least parts of it. There was a band in 1965 called The Birds that turned this poem into a song called Turn, Turn, Turn. And it just describes the reality that life has different and opposing seasons. It's not making a value statement about any of these seasons. It's just saying that this is reality. There's birth and there's death. There's planting and uprooting. There's killing and there's healing. There's war and there's peace. There's mourning and there's laughing. And if you live long enough, you'll likely see all of these seasons. And then verse 11 comes after verses 1 through 8. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Meaning, all of those different opposing seasons have beauty in them. Not, not that war is beautiful. It's not. It's terrible. Not that death is beautiful. It's not. It's terrible. But even in seasons that are full of those dark things, there's still beauty in them to see. And part of how we receive life as a gift is seeing the beauty that is in our lives. And the Bible says there's always beauty in your life. Always. And by beauty, we don't mean like a skin-deep, thin, superficial beauty. We mean the kind of beauty that evokes a sense of awe and wonder and eternity, the kind of beauty that makes an agnostic say, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. I was with friends a few months ago, and the question was this. What is a movie I probably haven't seen that I need to see? And one answer was Belfast. I haven't seen it, but I think it won some awards. One answer, it's an older movie. One answer was The Waterboy, which I think they meant as a joke. Um, but I think it's an important movie, especially because of my experience in eighth grade. My answer <laughs> was A Hidden Life. It's a Terrence Malick movie. It's beautiful. It's about an Austrian peasant farmer who refused to swear an oath to Hitler. And he refused, it's a true story, he refused to fight for the Nazis in World War II. And because he refused, he was arrested and executed. And it's a hard movie. It's a long movie. It, it's a slow-moving movie, but it's beautiful and it's convicting. And, and something happens throughout the movie, just these really subtle moments. In the midst of all the dark and the wrong and the cruel that happens to this man, there are these small moments all throughout where we see him seeing beauty around him. He's in prison, and he pauses outside to enjoy the sun. And then he writes home to his wife and says, the sun shines on the evil and the good. Uh, he admires the strength of the men that he is imprisoned with, and he writes home to celebrate their courage. He saw beauty in their life. He makes a new friend in prison, and there's a scene where they teach each other songs that they love. And it feels out of place. Like there's a simple moments, maybe part of the, 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 the parts that feel most uncomfortable, where there are these moments where he just stares at flowers and watches birds. And you almost at times want to yell at him, You're in prison, you're about to die. Your life is bleak, and yet he still sees beauty all around him amidst all the dark. And that movie reminds me of my favorite book. It's called The Hiding Place. It's about Corey Ten Boom, imprisoned by the same country in the same war, sent to a concentration camp for hiding Jewish people, and through all of the horrors that she went through, she still sees beauty. She gives thanks to God for smuggled Bibles and, and medicine that seems to never run out, and the beauty in worship services conducted in secret, and even in tulips that remind her of her garden at home. She saw beauty still, a time for peace, a time to war, everything beautiful in its time. And here's what I'm wondering, my friends, truly. Maybe that's how you become the kind of person that has the courage to die for what you believe, by never losing sight of the beauty that God's put in your life. What I'm wondering, friends, is maybe that's how you become the kind of person who has the courage to live a beautiful life by seeing the beauty that God has placed in our life. God has made everything beautiful in its time. I don't know what season you're in right now. I don't know if you'd say it's peace or war or love or hate or gather or scatter, but in this time, what beauty is in your life right now? Do you see it? 
I'm not asking you to ignore pain. God's word is asking us to see beauty, and it can coexist even with the ugly things in life. I was studying for this sermon in our backyard Thursday morning, and I just, I, I, always, I always want to first, as a human and a follower of Jesus, lay my life under the truths and receive them before I teach them. And so I was just asking, where do I see beauty in my life right now? And we have these two oak trees in our backyard, and there's beauty to them. And I know, they're, they're just trees, but they're older than me, and they're part of God's good, beautiful design, and somehow, even in this heavy world marred by sin, trees still grow, and they stretch their branches towards the sky, and there's something beautiful about that. And sometimes, I know it's odd, but sometimes I just stare at them, <laughs> and I think about Psalm 1. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, and it bears fruit and flourishes, and leaves don't wither, and there's beauty there in the psalm and in the trees. And I'm looking up at the trees, and Carrie comes out in the backyard, and I'm sure she thinks, oh, no, he's doing that thing with the trees again. <laughs> and she asks me a question about plans, and she goes back inside, and, and I think about her. And I think about us. We're almost 14 years into marriage, and our relationship is as healthy as it's ever been. Praise God. Um, there were hard marriage years, truly, but these are not those. We laugh a lot. We are still, after all these years, getting to know each other. We're changing together. She's tolerating the fact that I all of a sudden stare at trees, and that's not what she signed up for, but that's where we're at. And there's a, there's a beauty to carry Roller in every sense of the word, truly. But there's a beauty to us. There's a beauty to our 14 years and our story together. And, and when I take the time, I see it. I see the beauty of our marriage. I see it now. You, Citizens Church, you are a beautiful people. You are a beautiful church. Just to know your stories, and, your, and, and while I'm preaching up here, I see faces, and there's like this conversation happening where it's like I have a sermon to preach, and there's this thing I'm thinking in the back of my mind where it's like, I love that person. I adore that person. I can't believe that they've been through what they've been through, and they're as strong as they are. So many of you so sincerely love Jesus with your whole heart. And that comes out as a love for your Bibles and, and a love for your neighbors. And it comes out as fostering children and adopting children and weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice. You've suffered well, so many of you. This church is beautiful. What beauty can you consider that's in your life, friend? That's my list, and there's more. But what relationship, what, what thing in God's creation, and why it's so important is that beauty points to meaning and goodness, and beauty grounds us in the here and now, and something about beauty makes the strongest argument for God, for his presence. And the beauty in your life is an invitation to be present with God. I think it's part of why David prays to our beautiful God in Psalm 27 and says, one thing I ask, one thing I seek, to be present with you, God, and to gaze on your beauty. Would you do something at some point today? Would you just make a list of the beauty in your life? At some point this week, just think of one thing in your life that you would say, this is beauty I see, and then do this. When you see it, you know what you should do? Open your hands. God, life is a gift. You are the giver. God, you are beautiful. Thank you. Do good. Verse 12. Be present, see beauty, do good. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Chapter 5, verse 18 says something that we need to hear. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given, for this is his lot. Taken together, here's the wisdom. Do good with your lot. A lot in this culture was like drawing straws where the size of the lot you drew determined your place and your decision-making in life. So maybe you've heard, this is my lot in life, similar to another phrase, like this is the hand that I was dealt. But it's not negative. Here it's positive. God has given your lot. Zach Eswine in his book on Ecclesiastes says that our lot is a combination of four things. Everyone has these four things. We've been given a place to be, some things to do, some needs to meet, and some people to share it with. That's your lot. A place to be, some things to do, some needs to meet, and some people to share it all with. A place to be, where do you live? You live in Plano? You live in Richardson? You live in Frisco? Are you one of those super ambitious people who drives from Sherman to come here? What neighborhood do you live in? Think about where you are. That's your lot. 
God's given you a place to be, some things to do. What do you do for work? What are your responsibilities at home? Do you sell something? Do you fix something? Do you create things? Do you take care of someone? That's your lot. Some needs to meet, including your own. You'll eat today. If you remember last week and then even this week, so much of these verses talk about eating and drinking. You know why? Because everyone has to do that. It's a huge part of life. You will have to feed yourself today. You'll meet your own needs today. You'll meet other needs today, and that's your lot. Some people to share life with. Who is in your lot with you? Are you married? Do you have children? Do you have roommates? Who are your friends? Do you have a neighbor that you spend time with? Are you in a home group? Who are your coworkers? That's your lot. And you've been given a place to be, some things to do, some needs to meet, and some people to share life with. You know how you receive life as a gift? You open your hands and you do good with your lot. You do good with your lot. And what that means, first of all, and I want to be really gentle, what that means, first of all, is it means accepting your lot. Receive it. What I don't mean is being okay with sin or being okay with suffering or calling those things different than what God calls them. We said last week the right response to wrong and loss and sin is to grieve. The Bible gives us permission to look at the wrong in our lot and cry out, how long, O Lord? But for many of us, that's not our problem. Would you lean in? Our problem is not that we're grieved over what's wrong in our lot. Our problem is that when we look at our lot, all we see is what's wrong. And we see nothing else. And so all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to change my lot. And I don't see good in it. I'm not doing good in it. I definitely don't enjoy it like the passage says. Here's something. It is impossible to enjoy a life you are constantly critiquing. It's impossible. It's impossible to enjoy a life you're constantly judging and critiquing. If we go back to last week, it's impossible to live well with wringing hands and wandering eyes and clenched fists in our lot. You know, my beloved friends, you know what silences or at least quiets the critique? Life is a gift. You are the giver. This is my lot. Thank you, God. Receive your lot. Do good in it. How do I do good? Obviously, by being like Jesus and following Jesus and embodying the character of Jesus in the place you are and the things you have to do and the needs you meet and the people you share life with. And, and then remember this, do the good that you know to do. Just do the good that you already know to do in your lot. The fool, remember, the fool is not uninformed. The fool is unchanged by what they know. Do the good that you know to do. And if our answer just stayed with where we've been, part of that good is being present in your lot. Uh, I can only be here. I can only be now, so be fully present. When you eat later today, you'll eat later today. And maybe you go out after church or, or you eat at home after and you'll be in a place meeting the need to eat, maybe even eating with people that God has given you to share life with. You're doing good. You're doing, just by doing that, you're doing good. And it might sound trite, but it is specifically what Ecclesiastes uses as the example. The eternal God is somehow, some way present in that moment. Be present to his presence. God sees. And maybe thoughts come that try to pull you out of that moment or maybe uh, stress comes and you feel pressed or something like that. You know what would be great for everyone around the table to do? To put down their phones and to hold their hands open. God, life is a gift. You are the giver. Thank you for this food. This is my lot. Thank you, God. When some afternoon comes this week and you're folding the fifth basket of laundry, you know what's happening? You are in the place you're supposed to be doing the thing you're supposed to do meeting the needs for the people that you share life with. You're doing good. And no one's going to make a movie about that. Nothing about that is going to be praised by the world, but God sees and you're doing good. And look, maybe thoughts come that say, I'm tired of doing the same thing every day. I'm wasting my life. No one cares how hard I work. You know, that would be a great time to put down the clothes and to open your hands and pray, God, life is a gift. You are the giver. This is my lot. I love the people who wear these clothes. There's beauty in them. Thank you, God. Do good in your lot. And maybe what we expect are more spiritual answers than these. Doing good would be giving to the poor. Doing good would be reading your Bible. Yes, of course. Do the good you know to do. But what is beautiful about the life as a gift wisdom is that every single moment is a gift, which makes every single moment sacred and holy and an opportunity to live in the presence of God for the glory of God. And it invites us to live life with open-handed surrender to all that's been given by God. So yes, help the poor. And yes, read the Bible. And yes, confess sin. And yes, fast and pray and fold the laundry 
and stop for gas and make a meal and read a book and mow your lawn and visit friends and all of it open your hands and do good in your lot. Last one, receive joy. I'll be brief. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful. All five passages that talk about life as a gift mention joy or enjoyment, and this is the culmination of all the others. When you receive life as a gift, when you're present, you see beauty, you do good, your heart is more open to joy when it comes. Uh, This kind of joy is a little different than the joy the New Testament talks about. Paul's going to talk about rejoicing always, and that's the kind of joy rooted in the fact that we have unaltering, constant cause for rejoicing because of Jesus, and that's true. That's the more active joy Ecclesiastes talks about a more passive joy, a joy that we just receive. And and so it seems to mean that as you're living your heaven life and you feel joy, enjoyment, and the experience of joy, not happiness, not simply pleasure, but something deeper. Here's what joy is. Joy is when the soul exhales in relief and aches for more all at the same time. That's joy. And when that happens, receive it. I'm in the car a few weeks ago. I'm taking my four-year-old on a breakfast date. We're listening to her favorite song. We don't talk about Bruno. (laughs) Somehow it's still her favorite song. And it ends, and it's quiet, and we're just driving, and she says from the back seat, Dad? And I say, yeah, babe. And she says, I'm smiling at you. And I look in the rearview mirror, and her face is entirely committed to this huge smile. And I smile, and she says, Dad, do you like it when I smile at you? And I say, it's one of my favorite things in life. And I felt in this moment this intense sense of joy. My soul exhaled and ached for more. And then I thought this. She's getting older. This won't last forever. We don't do this enough. She won't smile at me like that when she's a teenager. In fact, she'll have some crush on some boy, and she'll smile at him. And I'll try not to hate him, but I will. (laughs) But I can't because I'm a pastor. And You know what I did? I turned that moment of joy into a problem to solve. Wringing hands. I went on in my head, and then I thought, I need to make sure to take her on more dates. Like, I need to... More than other dads take their daughters on. Like, I'll talk to Carrie tonight every Friday. No dad does every Friday, and so I'll do every Friday. And you know what I did? I turned the moment of joy into a competition to win. And then I thought, I have to somehow hold on to this. I have to somehow grasp it, and I have to somehow control it and and keep it forever and make it bend to my will. I wasn't angry, but I turned that moment of joy into a clenched fist moment. And all that's happening in my head. And she interrupted all that and said, Dad... Can we listen to We Don't Talk About Bruno again? (laughs) And you know what a better response is? Just receive it. Life is a gift. Receive the joy that comes from a four-year-old smile. It's fleeting. So just open your hands, Jamin, and be content to let it settle in your palms for just a moment. Even better than that, thank God for it. God, life is a gift. You are the giver. Who am I that a little one loves me and smiles at me? And maybe somewhere even in her smile is an eternal, all-powerful God smiling at me through the ordinary gift of that moment. Thank you, God. Receive joy. And we often find this joy in those small kinds of things, those small moments that if we're not present to them, we miss them. And I know life can be brutal, but that's the point. Life is often too hard to chase joy away when it comes. If you're present and you see beauty and you do good in your lot, as joy comes and goes, receive it, give thanks for it, see God in it. Life is a gift. Be present. See beauty. Do good. Receive joy. We'll end where we ended last week. Remember, we as Christians, we have the double gift, life and new life, creation and new creation, life in the heaven and life in the new heavens and the new earth. And if you're not sure where to start with all this, start with Jesus. Can I tell you about your Savior? Can I remind you the beauty of your Savior? He is present with you. Matthew 28, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. 
He is making you beautiful. Ephesians 5 will present you holy and blameless and above reproach. He has been and always will be good to you. 2 Timothy 2, even when we're faithless, he remains faithful. And it was his joy to save you. Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus is our great gift in this life and the next. He takes our wringing hands and he reminds us he solved our greatest problem. He takes our wondering eyes and he silences our shame. He takes our clenched fists and he softens them with his grace so that we might open our hands and receive life as a gift. Let's do that together. Would you pray with me? Would you hold your hands out in front of you like this? Just repeat after me. God, life is a gift. You are the giver. Thank you. We pray for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's our joy to be your people. Help us. Oh, Lord, help us to open our hands in this life. Help us, oh God, to be present to the here and now. Help us, oh God, to see the beauty that you've filled every moment with. Help us, oh God, to do good. Help us to receive joy so that we might approach this life, even in all the hevel of life, in a way that honors you. We love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.